Um, yeah, first of all, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, in such an incredible line of fantastic speakers. Uh, and uh, I will actually touch upon some of the things that you have uh, already. It's like set a stage for me. So thank you very much. We have been talking about huge companies and and the huge investments and so on. And we are actually the opposite. We're a very small company. Uh, but I'm also talking about something else, which is diagnostics. Why bother? And I was also given this uh, little crazy but uh, nice um, uh, topic. And of course I bother. I mean, my company is called 1928 Diagnostics. So I bother a lot. And I will tell you a bit more on why uh, this is. So again, thank you so much for having me here. Um, so we are 1928 Diagnostics, just to give you a brief uh, introduction. Uh, we are using the latest DNA technology to decode DNA from bacteria to keep you safe at the hospital. And I will come back to that. Um, but it all started uh, in 2014, where I, together with three other scientists and entrepreneurs, started 1928. Um, one of the other entrepreneurs, oh, it's actually one of my co-founders is over there, that's Suzanne. Um, so we actually became friends 20 years ago. We have 20 year anniversary this year. Um, we met at where? In Mandal at AstraZeneca, where we became friends, very good friends, and shared the passion, the passion for science, both of us are scientists, and the passion for business. And we had a lot of great times together and discussed how we could start a business. So we have like hundreds of ideas. And there may be a reason why it took us 15 years to start 1928. Um, so we iterated this for a long time. So the, this company was started by friendship and the, um, the productification of a research from Gothenburg as well. But to go back, uh, 91 years. It very much started in, two, uh, in 1928. What happened then? 1928 was the year when Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin not very far away from here. And since then, the lifespan of man has increased by 10 years. So Alexander Fleming, together with others, received the Nobel Prize uh, in 1945. And already by this time, he knew that bacteria may come, become resistant due to maltreatment. So he actually talked about that 74 years ago in his Nobel speech in Stockholm. And he also said, well, we, this will make us come into a post-antibiotic era. And actually, that is where we are today, unfortunately. According to the World Health Organization, antibiotic resistance is one out of three major threats against humanity besides the lack of clean water and the climate threat. This is a fact, but also we are convinced in, at 1928 that we can stop the scenario by collaboration with different stakeholders and by using cool, uh, very good technology, big data and collaboration. Well, why am I showing this picture? I mean, I guess most of you know, this is uh, Elizabeth Holmes who started uh, the diagnostics company Fairness in Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, 2003. She uh, was a Stanford dropout. And this, ha this fantastic idea, isn't it? I mean, to, from one drop of blood, being able to do hundreds of different analysis and do tailor-made treatment, right? So it was fantastic. And I, I, I'm quite sure that many of you thought the same thing when they launched, they been in stealth mode for more than 10 years, and then in 2014, they launched uh, the Edison. And we, we were all excited, but I mean, how, how did this happen? What's the secret? Because there were no scientific evidence and there were no exciting patents. So we thought, what's the secret? And then, I mean, a couple of years later, now they are accused of fraud and the trial will start next year. They did it in the wrong way. You should start with science. So maybe next time, and I believe this will be totally be something that we can do, but instead, 
we will start with science. And I've already mentioned, of course, my favorite, uh, <laughs> uh, which is not a, um, uh, which is of course the discovery of penicillin in 1945. And I will not go into any details. It's so nice to see that m most of you have referred to to Nobel prizes as well. Uh, but it's actually the discovery of DNA in 1962. As, uh, continuing with Cambridge uh, DNA sequencing, the fantastic method, uh, and together with PCR, that will lead us to what I will focus the core of the rest of this talk about, namely the fantastic technology of DNA sequencing or next generation sequencing. How many of you are familiar with this technology? Yeah, of course. Um, so, this is where I mean DNA sequencing today can do a lot of stuff that Fairness wanted to do by one drip of blood, but it need, they need a little bit more, but you can do a lot of different um, analysis from DNA. So this sketch uh, to the right here shows what's happened when it comes to speed. Uh, and using these technology that has emerged from a very non-scalable uh, uh, technology until today when we have third generation sequencers, which are actually, you know, Oxford Nanopore, for instance, they have uh, a DNA sequencer in the size of the cell phone so they can add a sample connected to your computer and then in less than six hours, get a fully digitalized genome from a human or a bacteria, uh, and then connect it to a software like 1928 and have a result in less than six hours. That is fantastic. But it's also very important with the cost, because this was an extremely uh, costly technology 20 or 19 years ago, which has uh, actually dropped faster than Moore's law. And today, you can do a full DNA sequencing for I would say a couple of bucks. And you can see here also how it has increased the usage of this technology for many different purposes. So now DNA sequencing from being a technology that totally revolutionized science is now entering clinical diagnostics. And that's where we are working with this technology for bacteria, because this is all about data. It's generation of data. Uh, of course, they get big data from DNA, but also all the other data that you could think of, patient data from patient records and so on. So what we can do and what is important is that we have the correct software so that we can crunch data from different sources, historical data, data from today, and also the data from tomorrow. Maybe I should. That is AI, right? So, for instance, for our company, yes, we work with AI, but we also need to wait for healthcare to be ready to adapt to the next AI level of products. And for instance, what we will do in this area is not only to work with DNA data, data that's the first step that we, uh, when we are moving into the market, but also to merge all different kinds of data in software to really tailor-made the diagnostics so that we can get the right treatment and precision medicine to the patients. So that's where we, uh, within a few years from now, hope that we will be doing data crunching, not only from DNA data. But being the tech company, this is what we want to do. So 1928 provides data-driven diagnostics. Starting with infection control, using DNA from bacteria, crunching it and giving answers of outbreaks going on and also decision support. So our mission is to leverage healthcare through tech and to go beyond modern healthcare by using this fantastic data that uh, we can, um, we have around us today and also to share it. This is just an example of what our product looks like. Uh, where we get data from different bacteria. So every line here is a bacteria, so that we do a familiar uh, family tree. So you can look on how closely related different bacteria that are collected from different patients at the ward, if, they, if there is an outbreak or not going on, uh, is given here, because you see how closely related they are. So here we have an outbreak. And then you can just click uh, on the sample, and then you get 
the profile of the antibiotics that you can use to treat this uh, bacteria. But now I don't know how much time, okay, 4.48, yeah, I will make this, I think, <laughs> maybe. So now we'll tell you the story about 1928 diagnostics and uh, our product, which is a software service that, as I've said many times now, decodes DNA from bacteria so that hospitals can identify, stop, and predict outbreaks of superbugs. So this will save not only lives of patients, also costs for healthcare and society, and the power of antibiotics in the long run. But have you heard about superbugs? I mean, they have two main characteristics. One, they are uh, antibiotic resistant, multi-resistant to antibiotics, and two, they are very good at spreading. Spreading within the hospital, between hospitals, and globally. So antibiotic resistance is one of the major threats against humanity and projected to kill 10 million people annually by 2050, according to a report. That is more than will die from cancer and more than tenfold increase from that of today. But we believe that we can stop this scenario, as I said, by collaboration and by outsmarting superbugs with software together with the hospitals and authorities and through collaboration. Um, so, but I will go back now just to tell you how did we found, found this idea. So in 2012, I was still a cancer scientist, actually. And uh, I was working together, was at, actually at, after work together with a friend of mine and a professor in bioinformatics. Uh, bioinformaticians are the guys uh, that works with big data, uh, crunches the big data and mines it for relevant biological and clinical data. For instance, they look for genes and mutations in bacteria that causes antibiotic resistance, right? So we were friends and we were out uh, to have a beer and we discussed the following, because at this time, uh, I was working with acute lymphocytic leukemia, uh, children with leukemia, and 90% of these children survive, which is fantastic in Sweden today, but 10%, they still die. And they do not die from cancer. They die from bacteria they actually get at the hospital during treatment. And then they cannot be treated fast enough because bugs are multi-resistant, right? So what's the problem? So why doesn't the hospitals have con entire control? Because they don't have or they had access to relevant technology, but they couldn't use it because they didn't have the software. Because the technology is... DNA sequencing, because you get the perfect genetic fingerprint of the bacteria and also understand what antibiotics can be used or not. They needed a software to crunch the data so that they could use it for outbreak analysis and treatment. And guess what? Eric, the professor in bioinformatics and my friend, he had both databases of antibiotic resistance genes and mutations causing resistance together with algorithms. So we thought that if we could take these assets, put it together into a product, and put it in the cloud, we could enable the use of this fantastic technology to patients all around the world so that they who had DNA sequencing can access this. Uh, and not only to save the lives and save costs for leukemia patients, but to all patients suffering from an infection. So yeah, we did. So we started the company in 2014, and today we have grown it into uh, 16 people, uh, not uh, close to as many as you have, but in Gothenburg, and we are growing. Um, so, and our software that analyzes now um, bacteria in 27 different clinical labs in 10 countries in three continents, and growing as well. But what is actually happening here? Oh, now I have 20 seconds. So you have to ask me exactly how this uh, happens, what, uh, what we do. 
but basically it's uh, from a blood sample, you can get a bacteria, you take the bacteria or any sample really, after the bacteria you take the DNA, put it in the DNA sequencer at the lab, and automatically the raw data file is analyzed, and in uh, one to 15 minutes, they have a report that answers one, is there an outbreak going on, and two, how can we treat this patient? The data can also be shared uh, locally at the hospital, uh, within the country, and we're also working and um, pioneering the space of data sharing internationally. So this is a global problem, and I mean, 5% of all patients at the hospital actually get a hospital-acquired infection. I'm sorry for being late. Um, 1.7 million people in the US only, 99,000 people die, and the related cost is 40 billion US dollars. So this is a very big problem, and our service can be applied to all of these patients. So this is the team uh, in Gothenburg. And um, as I said before, we are convinced that uh, we can stop this problem by collaboration between different stakeholders. So if you want to join us in the fight against antibiotic resistance, yeah, come chat with me afterwards. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time.